You know, something that we've seen a lot in recent years is the obnoxious demand that people become infatuated with the various media created by those with less life experience than a newborn sea turtle. Often this is reflected in the characters put on screen, because we're supposed to idolize them like they solved cancer, and yet none of them have any attributes worth noting, like Captain Marvel having all the personality of a piece of driftwood. And the less said about the recent conceptual rape of Galadriel, the better. This is not an absolute, though, as there is the occasional something decent created from time to time, because as we all know, even a broken clock is right twice a day. So let's move on to a different kind of girl boss. One that might actually kinda sorta maybe kind of work and figure out if the Woman King was even worth it. Now before we dig into this, please subscribe to join my kingdom so you don't miss a new video. Alright, now on to the black on black violence. The Woman King is primarily set in the kingdom of Dahomey, and no, I'm not talking about Kansas City. Rather, the former African nation now present-day Benin from the perspective of Nawe. She's a young woman who was captured with the intent to sell her, but this little plan is interrupted by the Agoji, led by Naniska. The Agoji are the Dahomey and Amazons, the primary military force of Dahomey, and they show this when the Agoji attack the village, killing all who resisted and taking the rest captive and brought back to Dahomey. It is here we are properly introduced to Amanda Waller's ancestor, Naniska, the general of the Agoji, and several other main characters like King Getzo, Amenza, and Lashana Lynch's eyebrows. Nawe and the others are given the choice to either join the Agoji or leave. Some do, some don't, and what follows is a training montage that almost looked like it was pulled straight from Mulan. The good one, not the cheese grater across the nuts from a few years ago. And I mean this seriously, as these characters struggle to get through their training, and some, like Nawe, have to use their wit to overcome the trials. And you know what? Good on you, movie. I'm kind of invested in these characters that genuinely struggle because they aren't perfect and do no wrong. Got my eye on you, though. Shortly afterwards, some representatives from the neighboring Oyo Empire arrive and proclaim the nearby ports are now theirs, and one of them is the man who raped Naniska so many years ago. Under the command of General bo 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 bo, -bo or something, anyway, they demand a tribute of 20 Agoji to allow Dahomey access to said ports for trade and leave three of their representatives there all by their lonesome. Yeah, okay. Jumping over to the port town, the film actually shows blacks being sold by blacks to blacks and whites. All right, not, not bad, film. So while Kunta Kinte is about to start filming Roots over there, over here, the Agoji arrive with their tribute. And who would have guessed it's the heads of the three representatives, because it couldn't have been more obvious they were going to get the 300 treatment. Naniska orders the rest of the Agoji to retreat while she goes to fight General Bozo, and instead of beating him without breaking a sweat, she actually kind of gets her ass beat? And... Wow, a female character who struggles against a man and only survives because another one helped her? This is almost blasphemy in today's modern culture narrative. You know what? Again, good job, movie. I've still got my eye on you, though. So Naniska scolds Nawe for disobeying her orders, and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar here calls Naniska out on her shit. Later, back in Dahomey, King Getso says he wants to quit the slave trade and move to palm oil. And there it is, the big historical inaccuracies. Bad movie. We'll get to that can of worms later. Anyway, we're introduced to Santo Ferreira, who does fuck all this entire movie, so let's get back to Dahomey preparing for war with the Yo-Yo Empire. They lay out explosive traps because apparently no one at the invading camp decided to put up some scouts or watchmen. That night, Nawe sneaks off to hang out with Santo's servant, Malik, in a scene that does absolutely nothing and makes me question why the fuck they were even introduced in the first place. Then, back at the camp, Nawe and Naniska are in the bath chamber when Naniska reveals that she had a daughter many years ago and, get this, buried a shark tooth in the baby's shoulder. So she cuts open Nawe's shoulder, and what do you know? She was the very kid. What the hell possessed her to do something like this? Well, not a clue, because the next day, the battle begins, and the Agoji, supported by the male half of the Dahomeyan army, do battle with the Jojo Empire, and many of the women are killed while a number are taken in as prisoners, including Nawe. This angers Naniska, who decides that night she is going to disobey the orders of King Getzo and sneak off to rescue Nawe. Meanwhile, while Nawe has been caged up along with Lashana Lynch and her eyebrows, who's feeling bummed because her arm is 
broken. Nawe talks some sense into her, and the next day they try to break out. And they almost do, but many of the guards hardly do anything, though, just standing there like bystanders on a New York subway who don't want to get involved. Well, most of the guards anyway, as Nawe and another are grabbed while Lashana takes off, but decides to turn around and not leave Nawe behind. This proves to be her downfall, as she becomes another gun violence statistic. Then Nawe breaks free of the guards so she can mourn her friend, and the guards let this happen instead of immediately throwing her back into the cave which would have been far better to see as a scene. Later that night, Naniska, who was followed by a large number of the Ogoji, besieges the port town and slaughters damn near everyone, whether they were just there for business or not. Fiera's last words are gurgle gurgle, and Naniska has her climactic battle with General Obo beating him, of course. Everyone goes home, King Getso cancels Dahomey's involvement with the slave trade, and everyone lives happily ever after. So, as you've gathered, this film is actually just meh on its own merit. The action is hit and miss, not that it isn't competent, but some variables are overlooked, or at least not refined. It's the same issue that Shang-Chi suffered from, where the younger cast who are trained in martial arts flow smoothly, while the older cast moves like the cartilage in their knees was replaced with ground cement. For example, Lashana Lynch doing her whirly-twirly, flippity-floppity, wackity-wavy, arm-flailing Black Widow moves looks fine. She's young and athletic, while Viola Davis, despite being in the gym to prepare for this role, looks like she sucks down oxygen tanks off-camera like she's free-climbing Mount Everest. There is also an awful lot of armpit stabbing going on here, like that front shot of Frodo after he was stabbed by the cave troll. Also, throats are slashed open like they cross paths with Sweeney Todd, yet there is less blood than your average UFC fight. This is sort of balanced out by the acting, which is pretty solid, with many of them showing up and doing what they do best, reinforcing why some of them are considered to be good actors and actresses, like Viola Davis and Lashana Lynch probably heading the cast with John Boyer you close behind. However, the rest of the cast are forgettable and make you wonder why they are even included in the first place, like Santo and Malik. Neither character will leave an impression, and you'd be forgiven for forgetting they were even in the film in the first place, as their scenes amount to absolutely nothing beyond padding out the runtime more than a 14-year-old's bra. Also, for some reason, everyone speaks in broken English with thick accents, bringing up that same nitpick I had about the Northmen. There is also this inconsistency, a, a tug of war, really, with the themes of following orders to the letter and leave no woman behind? Throughout the film, Nawe constantly runs back into the metaphorical fire to save other people, including Naniska, to which she is reprimanded because she didn't follow the plan. Naniska's plan, to be precise, so who's the dolt now? At least she was called out for it. Anyway, Naniska is of the mindset you follow orders to the letter, and if people die, they die. She does come around, so what's the problem? Well, one of the characters turns around only to get killed by doing exactly what what Nawe has been doing this whole time, so it's a little conflicting, like trying to have your slaves and trade them too. There are also a few, though not many, weird decisions characters make for one reason or another to just make the plot line up. The best example of this is the confirmation Nawe is Naniska's daughter, which forces Naniska to care instead of making her care more organically through learning that perhaps she shouldn't be so quick to leave other valuable soldiers behind. Dahomey is portrayed as being on the back pedal after all, so why not tie these threads together? Now, you're probably wondering, why do I feel a butt coming on? And you'd be correct, the movie isn't a bad watch necessarily, but what mostly holds it back and is the source of all the lashing this film has received, it is the blatant revisionist history. I am not an African historian, so going into this was eye-opening for me. So as we know, the film portrays the Kingdom of Dahomey as an even-tempered country that reluctantly dabbles in a little bit of the slave trade and was constantly on the backpedal due to more skirmishes with neighboring countries than the Israeli border. And by the end of the film, King Getzo abolishes the slave trade and decides to deal in palm oil, and everyone lived happily ever after. In reality, Dahomey was like the Robin Hood stock trading app for people. They were a brutal slave trade nation with more seizures for power than the entirety of Game of Thrones and endeavors for expansion than World of Warcraft. These people held a yearly event called the Annual Customs of Dahomey, which the translation from the native language for the ceremony literally is, quote, 
yearly head business. And not the kind your mom uses to pay the bills. No, over 500 prisoners, criminals, and even slaves were ritualistically beheaded during this event. Get this, right? Since Dahomey was very spiritual, one of the rituals they would force the new slaves to perform was a march around what they called the Tree of Forgetfulness. The slaves were forced to walk around the tree until they would lose the memories of their family, homeland, and their own culture. And this was in the belief it would prevent the ghosts of dead slaves from returning to haunt Dahomey. The Dahomey were so evil, they tried to break the mind, body, and soul of those enslaved. Anyway, slavery was the central pillar of the Dahomeyan economy, and the only reason it basically ended was after Dahomey was conquered by the French, of all people. Later in the Dahomeyan history, the real King Getzo tried to substitute palm oil for slaves in the Atlantic slave trade, but relied on the domestic African slave trade as a side hustle to pay the bills, basically. After repeated warnings to stop, Dahomey just kept fucking around until they found out in the first and second French Dahomeyan Wars in 1890 and 1892 to 1894. Ironically, the latter was launched on July 5th because those suffering under the tyranny of Dahomey were in need of serious doses of freedom and the French walked through the Dahomey like Refrigerator Perry did most linemen. This is how we know that the African warriors overall were probably extremely incompetent. You see, the Agoji were no exception, getting blown away in the numerous battles like they were playing duck hunt with a battle mech. Several battles resulting in zero French deaths compared to the well over 200 Agoji being BTFO'd so badly that that whole wing of the Dahomeyan military literally ignored summons for the reinforcement of future incursions. And until they were conquered, their slaves were traded for gold, firearms, fabric, and tobacco. That's right, Dahomey was selling people for cigarettes before prison made it cool. Also, as a funny note, President Thomas Jefferson outlawed all participation with the international slave trade with the act prohibiting importation of slaves in 1807. So, at the end of this movie, when King Getzo says, to paraphrase, this shows the Europeans and Americans they can't control us, I get to firmly say, Fuck you to the woke tards that wrote this political perversion of the past and those who support it. How pathetic. We weren't even supposed to be there and yet we're blamed for shit. And pathetic really is the word because these writers are so desperate for my representation. They turned one of the worst propagators of the slave trade into the heroes. This twists my balls like a back alley masseuse and is almost what ruined the king for me as well. The king was about King Henry V who was turned into a reluctant prince who never wanted the power in the first place and was false flagged into clapping France's cheeks like, well, almost everyone, I guess. The Dahomey were one of the few exceptions. In reality, Henry V was a war prodigy who was increasingly aggressive and brutal, who wanted to invade France more than his own father. I apply the same standard here. If you grossly rewrite history in this way, then you should be beaten with a history book until I can read the ink in your skin. And yes, this goes for all kinds of film, as much as I love them, Braveheart and 300. Come on, it doesn't matter. Let's try to keep this more together, folks. But I forget we live in a world in which history is the equivalent of Voldemort to those who would sacrifice their morals to be part of the in-crowd. So be it, I suppose. This movie won't have a long life after its theater run, and they couldn't even get that title right. I say, let this movie be a lesson that modern politics in film is an Ouroboros, essentially. It is ever in the pursuit to further deep-throat its own dick. Every boycott or pushback is nothing more than a simple gag reflex to muscle through in its own test of will until it has consumed itself and drowns at its own stale cum. Now, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.